The test is in four sections. Write all your answers on the question paper. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Listening section one. You will hear a conversation between a travel agent and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to get some information about trips to New Zealand.、Uh, certainly. Take a seat, and I'll be right with you. Thanks. Now, where would you like to go in New Zealand? Well, I was hoping to do a bit of travelling around. Actually, there are a few things I'd like to see and do before I go back home. Right. One thing I really want to do is go to Christchurch. I have relatives living there that I can stay with, my mother's cousin, and I've heard it's a nice place. The woman says she has relatives living there, so the first activity, visit family. Has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to seven. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to get some information about trips to New Zealand. Uh, certainly, take a seat, and I'll be right with you. Thanks. Now, where would you like to go in New Zealand? Well, I was hoping to do a bit of travelling around. Actually, there are a few things I'd like to see and do before I go back home. Right. One thing I really want to do is go to Christchurch. I have relatives living there that I can stay with, my mother's cousin, and I've heard it's a nice place. Yes, it's a lovely city. And staying with relatives will help with the budget, of course. The budget? It will save you some money. Oh right. Well, I'm not too worried about that. I've saved quite a bit of money working in Australia. Oh, that's nice. Good for you.、Uh, well, you know that New Zealand consists of two main islands: the North Island and the South Island. And Christchurch is on the South Island. Is it? I was never very good at geography at school. <laughs> Do you have a map I could look at?、Uh, sure.、Uh, here we are. Right. I see. And well, then I'd also like to spend some time in Auckland, and maybe I could do an English language course there. Can you organise that sort of thing for me? Oh, certainly. We'd be happy to arrange that.、Uh, but bear in mind that Auckland is in the North Island. Okay. And I'd also like to do some skiing, or maybe even some snowboarding. I hear New Zealand is a great place for that. Yes, absolutely. But、uh, you should go to Auckland first for your studies, and then you can get the ferry across to the South Island and take the bus down to the snow. Oh, I don't like boats very much. <laughs> I'm not much of a sailor. I think I prefer to fly. <laughs> right.、Um, what about joining a walking tour? That could be really fun. Not sure about walking, but joining a tour might be a good way to travel because then I might make some friends my own age. Now let's get some details.、Uh, can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Su Ming Li, but you can call me Su. <laughs> Okay, Sue. And what's your address here in Melbourne? I'm living with my aunt in the suburb of Kew. It's twenty-nine Lock Street. That's 
L O C H, not L O C K. Do you have a phone number that I can get you on? The best thing would be if I give you my mobile. I always have it on me. It's o four o two double five eight double nine two. Okay, and、uh, when do you want to travel? Because you'll need to be down south in July or August. Oh yes, of course. That's winter, isn't it? So I better go to Auckland in May. Yes. Let's say、um, departing from Melbourne on the first of May. That's a Saturday,、mm. and then you could begin your course on Monday the third. That sounds great. And how long would you like to study for?、Um, a month, two, three. What do you think? Well, I'll probably need more than a month.、Uh, what about eight weeks until the end of June? Fine, I'll see what I can do. Oh, and、uh, how would you like to pay for this? On my visa card, if that's possible. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Hello, Sue. It's Angelo from Cosmos Travel here. I've booked your flight, and I've found you an English college called the Harbour Language Centre. Great. Where exactly is that?、Uh, well, have you got that little map I gave you yesterday? Ah,、uh, yes. You see where the harbour is with the three wharves and the water. Yes, got that. Okay, there are two parallel streets, Key Street, that's Q U A Y, and Customs Street. The building where the college is located is on Key Street, opposite Prince's Wharf. Right, got it. And what about accommodation? Well, I've booked you into a hotel for the first three nights. And then the accommodation officer will find you a family to live with. Good. And where's the hotel? It's a short walk from the college, on the corner of Queen Street and City Road. Which corner exactly? On the left-hand side, as we're looking at the map. Okay, near the little park. Yes, that's right. And what about a good bookshop? I'm going to need to buy a dictionary and some English books. Yes, well, I believe there's a really good language bookshop on the corner of Customs Street and Queen Street. It's near the college, so that's pretty convenient. Thank you so much. You've been really helpful. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Listening, section two. You will hear an extract from a radio program about a famous bridge. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to eighteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to eighteen. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is nearly three quarters of a century old, and to help celebrate this important occasion, our reporter Sarah Chambers has compiled this brief history of her favourite bridge. 
A bridge is more than just a crossing over a river or a waterway. It is a landmark in its own right, a landmark which allows us to identify one city from another. Think, for instance, of the Bridge of Sighs in Venice, or the magnificent Charles Bridge in Prague. Each of these cities can be recognised by their famous bridges. The Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is another example of a city known by its bridge. But in addition to this, a bridge is a kind of ornament for a city, similar, if you like, to a cathedral or a palace. Here in Sydney, we may not have our own palace, but we do have our famous and much-loved bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is sometimes affectionately known as the coat hanger because of its arched shape. It was built back in the 1930s, and so the bridge is coming up for a significant birthday. Let's have a little look at its history. Although the idea of building a crossing over Sydney Harbour had been discussed many years earlier, it wasn't until the year 1916 that the state government agreed to allocate some money for the construction of a bridge. The chief engineer for the bridge was a man called Dr John Bradfield, a brilliant engineer who supervised the entire project from beginning to end. First, they had to decide on a design, so he organised an international competition to choose a design and ultimately got the one he wanted. The job went to a British engineering firm and the contract was signed in 1924. The design he chose was the single arch bridge that you see today, made of steel with a tower at either end. In 1926, construction finally began. The first thing they had to do was demolish 800 houses around the site where the towers were to be built. The poor families, however, never received any compensation for this. But the project created thousands of jobs, much needed in those difficult times. Of course, like all projects of this size, it took much longer to build than originally planned. It was supposed to have been finished by 1930, but actually it wasn't completed for another two years. It also cost twice as much as the original quote, coming in at £9.5 million instead of the agreed contract price of £4.2 million. But what's new? <laughs> The opening ceremony took place on the 19th of March, 1932, and a large crowd gathered for the occasion. The Premier of the state was just about to cut the ribbon when suddenly a man rode through the crowd, mounted on a horse, and slashed the ribbon with his sword. He wanted to be the first to cut the ribbon. Anyway, they tied the ribbon back together and the ceremony continued. The man on the horse was fined five pounds for his offensive behaviour. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. Now listen and answer questions 19 and 20. Since then, millions of cars have crossed the bridge, each paying a toll to do so. By the early 1980s, the government had paid off the loan for the money they'd borrowed all those years before. But motorists continued to pay to cross from north to south. This money was subsequently used to build a tunnel under the harbour to reduce the amount of traffic on the bridge. The tunnel was opened in 1992 and cost $544 million. It is 2.3 kilometres long and is equipped with all the latest technology, including closed-circuit television to monitor any problems. And it has most definitely reduced the load on the bridge as it carries around 75,000 vehicles each day, which would otherwise have to use the bridge and it's apparently strong enough to withstand the impact of a ship or even the impact of an earthquake. The tunnel has been a welcome solution to Sydney's traffic problems, but of course, a tunnel could never compete with a bridge as a landmark for any city. So let's wish the bridge a very happy birthday. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Listening, section 3. You will hear two students discussing the subject of rock art. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, David. Oh, hi, Mia. Sorry I'm a bit late. Oh, no problem. Thanks for agreeing to help me with my assignment today. I really needed to go over it with someone. Sure. You were going to talk about European rock art, weren't you? Yes, the rock drawings in the caves of Lascaux in western France. Oh, fantastic. Over 13,000 years old, I believe. What sort of drawings are they? They're drawings of animals, on the whole, but you can also find some human representations, as well as some signs. There are roughly 600 drawings at Lascaux. Really? Were they mostly pictures of bulls? Well, no, actually. The animal most depicted was the horse. Hmm. Have a look at this graph. Hmm. It shows the distribution of the different animals. You see? First the horse, and then, after that, a sort of prehistoric bull. Oh, OK. That's interesting, isn't it? And the third most commonly drawn creature was the stag. There were some other animals, but these are the main ones. What are the drawings like? I mean, what sort of style? Well, the bulls are depicted very figuratively. They're not very realistic. They're very big by comparison to the other drawings of people and signs. They appear to be almost three-dimensional in some cases, following the contours of the cave walls, but... Of course, they're not. Amazing. Perhaps they felt these animals were the most impressive and needed to be represented like that. Yeah, maybe. The drawings of humans, by contrast, consist of just simple lines, like the stick figures my little sister draws. Perhaps humans were seen as less important. Hmm, perhaps. What about the signs? How did they draw them? There doesn't appear to be much evidence of signs, and those that have been found are usually made up of little points. Rather like Aboriginal art from Australia. Yes, something like that, but not as complex, of course. So, apart from the bulls and horses and stags, were there any other creatures depicted? In one or two chambers you do find pictures of fish, oh. but they're quite rare. What sort of size is the cave? It must be quite large to have that many pictures. Well, it's actually a number of interlinking chambers, really. Here's a map showing where the different drawings can be found. Oh, good. Let's have a look at that. The first 20 metres inside the cave slope down very steeply to the first hall in the network. That's called the Great Hall of the Bulls. Here. OK. Then, off to the left, we have the painted gallery, which is about 30 metres long and is basically a continuation of this first hall. But further into the cave. Exactly. Oh. Then we find a second, lower gallery called the lateral passage. This opens off the aisle to the right of the Great Hall of the Bulls. It connects the next chamber with an area known as the main gallery. At the end of the main gallery is the Chamber of Felines. There are one or two other connecting chambers, but there's no evidence of man having been in these rooms. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Is the cave open to the public today? Well, no, because after the initial discovery in 1940, it was opened and literally millions of people came through to see the drawings. Uh. Then, in the 50s, the experts started to worry about the damage being done to the drawings and the government finally closed the Lascaux cave in 1963. Is that so? It wasn't really the tourists that were doing the harm, but the fact that after thousands of years, the cave was suddenly opened to the atmosphere and so bacteria and fungi started to destroy the pictures. 
You need a special permit to enter the cave now, and very few people can get that, unless they're scientists or have some official status. It's a shame, but I can see that they had to do something to protect the cave. So that means you can no longer see this rock art. Well, not exactly. What they've done is recreate the drawings in a man-made cave, which you can visit. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, the authorities decided to reproduce the two best sections of the site, so they've created a life-size copy of the Hall of the Bulls and of the painted gallery. It's just a cement shell, which corresponds in shape to the interior of the original. So now you can visit the caves without actually harming any of the thirteen thousand year old paintings.、Mm-hmm. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Listening, section four. You will hear an extract from a university lecture on the topic of marketing. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Last week we looked at some general principles associated with marketing, and today I'd like to look at some of those points in a little more detail. So, what is marketing? Or put another way, what does the term marketing mean? Many people think of it simply as the process of selling and advertising. And this is hardly surprising, when every day we are bombarded with television adverts, mail shots, and telephone sales. But selling and advertising are only two functions of marketing. In fact, marketing, more than any other business function, deals with customers. So perhaps the simplest definition is this one: marketing is the delivery of customer value and satisfaction. At a profit. In other words, finding customers, keeping those customers happy, and making money out of the process. The most basic concept underlying marketing is the concept of human needs. These include basic physical needs for things like food, as well as warmth and safety. And marketers don't invent these needs; they're a basic part of our human makeup. So, besides physical needs, there are also social needs. For instance, the need to belong and to be wanted. And in addition to social needs, we have the need for knowledge and self-expression, often referred to as individual needs. As societies evolve, members of that society start to see things not so much in terms of what they need, but in terms of what they want. And when people have enough money. These wants become demands. Now, it's important for the managers in a company to understand what their customers want, if they're going to create effective marketing strategies. So there are various ways of doing this. One way at supermarkets, for instance, is to interview customers while they're doing their shopping. They can be asked about their buying preferences, and then the results of the survey can be analyzed. This provides reliable feedback on which to base future marketing strategies. 
It's also quite normal for top executives from department stores to spend a day or two each month visiting stores and mixing freely with the public, as if they were ordinary customers, to get an idea of customer behavior. Another way to get information from customers is to give them something. For instance, some fast food outlets give away vouchers in magazines or on the street that entitle customers to get part of their meal for nothing, as well as being a good way of attracting customers into the restaurants to spend their money. It also allows the managers to get a feel for where to advertise and which age groups to target. Another strategy employed at some well-known theme parks, such as Disneyland, is for top managers to spend at least one day in their career touring the park dressed as Mickey Mouse or some other cartoon character. This provides them with the perfect opportunity to survey the scene and watch the customers without being noticed. Okay. Well, we mentioned customer satisfaction at the beginning of this lecture, and I'd like to return briefly to that as it relates to what we've just been talking about. If the performance of a product falls short of the customer's expectations, the buyer is going to be dissatisfied. In other words, if the product you buy isn't as good as you'd expected, then the chances are you'll be unhappy about it. If, on the other hand, performance matches expectations. And the product you buy is as good as you expected, then generally speaking, the buyer is satisfied. But smart companies should aim one step higher. They should aim to delight customers by promising only what they can be sure of delivering, and then delivering much more than they promised. So then, if, as sometimes happens, performance is better than expected. The buyer is delighted and is twice as likely to come back to the store. Now, let's move on to look at the role of advertising. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.